Joining us today are Kariti Nagesh Gowda, Chair of the OpenVX Working Group, Frank Brill of Cadence, Mike Schmidt of AMD, and Neil Trevet, President of the Kronos Group. With that, I'll turn the helm over to Neil Trevet and we'll get started. Neil? Yep, thanks, Jeff. Hey, everyone. I'm Neil Trevitt, and I work on developer ecosystems at NVIDIA, and I am uh, president of the Kronos Group. And I'm going to give a short introduction on the origins and the goals of OpenVX before we get into more details uh, from the other speakers that are here today. So let's start by introducing Kronos. Uh, if you haven't come across us before, Kronos is an open standards consortium. Uh, we provide a safe place for the industry to cooperate and create interoperability standards. These standards enable applications to access the power of 3D graphics, virtual and augmented reality, and parallel computation, including vision and inferencing acceleration. We are a nonprofit organization, and all of the, the standards that we create are open and royalty free for the industry to use. Uh, we've been creating standards for 20 years now and have almost 160 members that includes everyone from the largest companies down to small startups. Uh, any company who wishes to join Kronos is welcome to participate, to have a voice and a vote in how Kronos standards evolve. And here are some of the most active standards currently being developed by Kronos. There are four main groupings, 3D acceleration APIs, including Vulkan, OpenGL and WebGL, Initiatives around 3D asset formats, including GLTF and the new 3D Commerce Working Group. The OpenXR API standard for portable, augmented and virtual reality. And lastly, a family of APIs and languages for parallel computation, vision acceleration and inferencing. Um, they include OpenCL, NNEF and the feature OpenVX, which is where we're going to be focusing today. So when Kronos started to develop OpenVX, and VX, by the way, stands for Vision Acceleration, uh, Kronos already had a long history of developing 3D graphics APIs, such as OpenGL and OpenGL ES. 3D APIs, such as OpenGL and the new generation Vulkan, are defined by a precisely designed specification that enables multiple silicon vendors to each implement the API and optimize it for their own processor architecture. Uh, this enables healthy market competition where silicon vendors can innovate on maximizing performance and minimizing power without introducing industry fragmentation for software developers. This open standard approach is in contrast to open source projects that focus on creating a single shared implementation of a library or application. The genesis of OpenVX occurred when Kronos realized that there was an industry need for an open standard API to enable vision silicon vendors to ship optimized drivers for their processors, just like GPU vendors had been able to do for many years. However, unlike the 3D market, where every silicon vendor uses some sort of GPU, vision acceleration uses a wide variety of processor architectures. And so a vision API that's aiming for wide industry adoption needed a higher level of abstraction so it could be effectively mapped to any type of silicon. And so OpenVX was born with a graph level programming abstraction. OpenVX graphs enable a developer to program complex vision algorithms by simply connecting a set of predefined functions or nodes. And over time, the sophistication of Open, OpenVX graphs has grown to include a broad set of functionality and increased graph controls such as conditional execution that selectively executes portions of a graph. Additionally, as machine learning has become increasingly important for vision processing, OpenVX has evolved to add inferencing acceleration alongside the original vision functionality. OpenVX accelerates inferencing by defining nodes to represent neural network layers and a rich set of tensors and tensor operations, which together can represent many types of neural networks. Most recently, OpenVX can now import complete trained networks in Kronos's neural network exchange format called NNEF, 
which in turn can be converted from popular industry machine learning formats through standard open source tools created and hosted by Kronos. NNEF actually is another great example of an open standard complementing open source frameworks by providing a stable specification that can be directly imported by harder drivers, in contrast to open source framework formats that can often change rapidly, often without any warning. We mentioned that OpenVX's high-level graph architecture enables deep optimization across diverse process architectures, but how does that actually work in, in practice? Here, here are some of the most common optimization techniques used by OpenVX implementers that may be used in various combinations depending on the underlying silicon. On the left, because OpenVX defines the complete graph before runtime execution, the graph can be split and scheduled to run across all available processors in a system. And also, the graph is known up front, so memory for intermediate buffering can be calculated and pre-allocated. And that memory can be efficiently reused without fear of overflow or fragmentation. The yellow block shows kernel fusion, which is a very common graph optimization technique where a whole subgraph can be collapsed into a more efficient single node. And last but not least on the right, data tiling is a technique commonly used on GPUs where an image is to be processed is split into chunks and processed by a common a complete subgraph of operations completely in the cache. These types of optimization techniques result in real world acceleration that often matches or exceeds the performance of hand tuned code with significantly lower development effort and far greater portability to other systems. A very common question is how does OpenVX compare to OpenCV? Well, OpenCV is an extensive open source library of computer vision functions. It's a tremendous industry resource, very often used for research projects and prototyping. As an open source library, it's complementary to OpenVX, which is this API standard to enable processor vendors to ship optimized silicon drivers. OpenVX enforces conformance testing uh, across different vendors to ensure cross-vendor reliability and consistency. Both OpenCV and OpenVX can use Kronos's OpenCL for low-level acceleration, and both include inferencing operations. However, in general, OpenVX has a tighter integration of neural networks and custom accelerated nodes into its graph architecture. Last but not least, OpenVX is protected by the Kronos IP framework, and so all parts of the OpenVX specification are guaranteed to be royalty free. But another common question after we compare OpenVX and OpenCV is how does OpenVX with its set of highly optimized nodes compare to the broader functionality of OpenCV? Well, Firstly, the, the set of OpenVX nodes has been growing steadily over time and is actually now partitioned into a number of carefully selected feature sets that are targeted at vertical market segments, such as inferencing and safety critical systems that can be implemented and tested as officially conformant. But no, no matter how many nodes are defined by the specification, OpenVX developers will often need to create their own custom nodes. And the good news is that OpenVX is fully extensible, including interop with OpenCL that enables fully accelerated custom nodes within an OpenVX graph. Using OpenCL interop, OpenVX can provide a command stream to OpenCL while sharing memory, bu memory buffers for asynchronous operation between the OpenVX and OpenCL runtimes. So, Lastly, how does OpenVX get deployed through the industry? Uh, Kronos Working Groups actually produce much more than just the specification documents, as any meaningful open standard also needs full conformance tests to ensure drivers are correctly implemented, and an adopters program by which a silicon vendor can verify their OpenVX implementation is fully conformant. An adopter making a successful test submission for review by the OpenVX working group is enabled to use the OpenVX logo. 
Kronos charges a, a modest adopter's fee to silicon vendors implementing OpenVX to cover the cost of maintaining the adopter's program, but there is no per device royalty. And in return, conformant OpenVX implementations enjoy the protection of the Kronos IP framework. And there is never any charge to software developers to use any Kronos standard. The OpenVX Working Group has also created an open source implementation of OpenVX that is a useful education resource and has recently been ported with some optimizations to Raspberry Pi, and we'll hear more about that later on. So that's the end of my quick introduction. As OpenVX continues to evolve, Kronos remains committed to playing a vital industry role by providing a safe space for companies to cooperate to create open standards that benefit their own business and the wider industry. If your own company is using Kronos standards and would like a voice and a vote in how these standardization activities evolve, or you wish to implement OpenVX or any other Kronos standard on your silicon, Kronos warmly welcomes any company that wishes to participate, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. So let me pass over to Mike from AMD who's going to take over the screen for an OpenVX demonstration. Over to you, Mike. I'm uh, Mike Schmidt. I'm Director of Software Engineering for Computer Vision and Machine Learning at AMD. And I'm going to give a few highlights of uh, some of our products that use the OpenVX standard. AMD has been a strong supporter of Kronos and all the various standards uh, for many years. Uh, and we first started shipping uh, an OpenVX implementation almost five years ago. The Rockham MI Vision product from AMD is the one that includes OpenVX. And I've got our GitHub uh, webpage here that I'm going to scroll through and give you some highlights. So uh, the first item uh, is just the basic uh, OpenVX that you can use uh, in MI Vision X, and we have some extensions. Uh, these include uh, a neural net uh, inference library, as well as uh, an OpenCV extension. As uh, Neil mentioned, OpenCV has got some uh, advantages and disadvantages compared to OpenVX, but we've encapsulated uh, most of the OpenCV functionality uh, that you can use from OpenVX. Uh, we have a uh, neural net model compiler and optimizer. Uh, with this, you can take a model that's been trained uh, and either in the Onyx uh, format or the Kronos NNDF exchange format, we can uh, import that and uh, compile it so it runs as an OpenVX graph. There's many optimizations, and uh, I think Kiriti may uh, get into some of those uh, later in today's talk. Uh, another uh, component that we build on top of OpenVX is uh, new this year. It's uh, Rally, which is a Radian augmentation library. Uh, what that does is it takes images and applies various augmentations to them in a graph that is built uh, using OpenVX. And so you can do augmentations like changing color formats, uh, changing contrast, uh, adding noise, uh, rotations, uh, flipping. And you do this uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is you may be training a neural net and you by, by providing all these augmentations, you're providing more images as more variants of the image, and it makes the neural net train in a more robust fashion. Uh, it also can provide uh, the accuracy, the, the final accuracy that you get can be higher because you've done many different augmentations of the images. So when you actually validate or test, you're going to have seen some of those uh, variants of the uh, base images. There's a number of uh, utilities uh, that come with MIVisionX. Uh, I won't go into 
all of them, there, there's many tools that you can use. Uh, but one particular one is RunVX, which is essentially a command line uh, tool that allows you to run an OpenVX node or OpenVX graph. It makes it very easy for uh, debugging your OpenVX graphs or for uh, just doing some quick prototyping. And uh, that's about uh, all the uh, components I'm going to talk about that are directly related to OpenVX. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Frank from Cadence. All right. Uh, so my name is Frank Brill. I work at Cadence in the Tensilica DSP group. Uh, and I'm going to introduce a little bit about, uh, about Cadence's offering in OpenVX. Uh, so first a little bit about uh, Cadence itself. So Cadence uh, actually has a number of businesses. You might know us as a, as a, um, a developer tool, a Silicon developer tool company. But we also have a, uh, a very uh, active and successful IP business. And in particular, we have a Vision DSPs, uh, which is uh, what our uh, OpenVX uh, offering runs on. And we also have a... Uh, Deep Neural Accelerator, DNA, uh, which is uh, more specialized for um, neural network applications. And as you can see, uh, we're, we're shipping um, uh, a number of these uh, devices uh, all over the world with many partners. Uh, and so the offering that we have uh, is actually a very customizable and scalable offering where uh, you can uh, actually, depending on your application, how much uh, performance you need uh, or how much power savings you need to do, uh, you can actually customize our IP. And our uh, so our customers uh, create system on chip devices uh, that include our IP. And that IP is is customized depending on what they, they need to accomplish with it. Uh, and so uh, to go with that uh, IP, we have a number of software uh, libraries and tools uh, that uh, you can use to implement your algorithms and applications on the IP. And uh, of course, OpenVX being one of them, you can see here, uh, we also offer libraries for OpenCL, uh, another Chrono standard, and then just uh, various CV libraries and an implementation of simultaneous location and mapping. Um, so uh, that's, that's uh, our company. So let's get into uh, what we're offering uh, on a particular uh, device. So the main device that we run OpenVX on, uh, it's actually a family of devices. Uh, and we, the Vision P6 and Q7 are kind of the flagships of that. Um, and you can get this IP and customize it. Uh, I'm not going to try and explain everything on this slide, but you can customize this IP. Uh, a lot of the, the stuff here is optional. Uh, and so you can decide uh, what, what you need. Uh, but basically, you've got a, a VLIW uh, and uh, SIMD architecture that... Uh, is highly efficient and performant uh, for uh, imaging, video, and uh, uh, AI neural network applications. Um, what I want to point out here is on the uh, right-hand side of the block diagram, we have uh, a, a DMA engine. And so uh, th it's very important for these high bandwidth applications to be able to manage the memory accesses. Uh, and so this DMA engine is connected to a, a bus that goes out to some large uh, memory, you know, your, your uh, uh, dynamic RAMs, uh, some, some number of gigabytes. And uh, then you have uh, uh, another bank of memories here at the top uh, that are sort of a fast internal memory, uh, basically like a cache. Uh, but you can manage that cache by a program uh, directly because you know the access pattern of your application. So you can actually have the, uh, the data pulled in via this DMA engine into these memory banks so that most of the work can be done out of this uh, fast memory. So let me show on the next slide more of a sort of a, a stylized uh, diagram here. So again, we've got this uh, 
just a box for the Vision DSP, and we have another box for the, the local memory, where you have a very fast access uh, to the local memory. And then you have uh, an external memory uh, that is big enough to fit a bunch of images and whatnot, but uh, is much lower in terms of its, its access time. So uh, I think probably many of you, most of you are familiar with just the memory hierarchy of caches. Uh, uh, but what we can do with this DMA engine is potentially do something more efficient than a cache because again, you know the access pattern so you can actually bring uh, data in before you need it. Um, and, and so uh, you can set up this, uh, well, if you look down here, there's this little toy graph. Uh, you get an input and you do a couple of uh, horizontal and vertical filters and then you merge them and, and you create an output. Um, so what you can do is uh, you can take this graph that is specified in OpenVX uh, as, you know, just a full, uh, each, each of these blocks kind of represents a whole image and, a, and an operator on that image. And what you can do is, is actually break that down into uh, tiles. So uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, by, by Neil. You can, you can tile this image so you grab a, a chunk of it and you use the DMA engine to pull it into this local memory. And then you can do several operators on it while it's still in that fast local memory and then use the DMA engine uh, to send the result back out. And because the DMA engine is a separate processor, uh, you can actually do all of these things in parallel. So while you're uh, working on a, a particular tile, uh, the next tiles are being uh, DMA'd in, and the next uh, and the, the final tile at the end is being DMA'd out. Uh, so you basically have basically three things going on at the same time. Now, if you want to uh, code this by hand, uh, which you would normally do on some of these architectures. Um, it is, uh, you, you have to learn about the DMA engine and how it works and you have to set up all of this tiling and whatnot. Um, but the good thing about the, the OpenVX implementation offered by Cadence Tensilica is um, basically that it does all of this for you. Um, so you, as the programmer, you set up this, this graph and, and then the, the uh, uh, the implementation, the cadence implementation of OpenVX, uh, looks at it, analyzes it, breaks it down, and then does all of this extra uh, uh, magic for you um, automatically. So uh, what it looks like in a block diagram is, is like this. Uh, you have your user program that is, is running OpenVX uh, using the, the OpenVX API uh, and creating graphs. And at some point after you've created your graph, you're, you're done and you verify the graph. And in the cadence implementation of verify graph, what happens there is, well, this is where all the, the magic happens, where uh, you get, uh, we, you, you actually invoke something we call the graph mapper. And that is the thing that analyzes uh, your graph, uh, the size of the images that you need to, to process, the size of the memory that you have available, and figures out how many tiles uh, to allocate, does all of the memory allocation, figures out how to chain things and sets up all the DMA. And re the result is just a binary script, which is just a series of DMA uh, commands and uh, function calls uh, that, that you can then ac uh, execute. So once you have that binary script, you then can call uh, process graph. Uh, and, and note that this is all happening on some host where, well, you can actually do this on the DSP, but uh, usually our customers have a separate host uh, that might be uh, an x86 or an ARM or something. And it's doing all of this, uh, this stuff. And then uh, you finally, you say process graph, you actually want to execute. Uh, and that's, that sends communication over to the, the DSP engine. Uh, and there's runtimes on either side to manage this communication. And then all the work actually happens uh, with uh, using the DMA library and, and the library that, that actually does the, the functions uh, and manages all of that. So on the, on the host side, basically you just say uh, process graph and then a whole bunch of work happens over on the DSP and you can actually, while that, that DSP work is happening, you can be doing something else over here on the host. Uh, and they, they, uh, all of this, this uh, communication from the shared memory uh, is done automatically. And then you get a message, well, process graph uh, finishes and, and you can uh, go on to the next thing on the host.
Uh, and so here's an example uh, of uh, a, a simple application where uh, what we're doing here is background subtraction. So you're doing, uh, you've, you've got a scene uh, up here where you've got a dog uh, running after a ball and you have an, a model of the background. And when something like the dog or ball comes into it, you can see the difference here. Uh, and, and track the dog running after the ball. So, so, uh, so this is a simple um, uh, uh, method for doing that. And you can see the graph. Uh, and, and so you, you grab the image, you, you, um, you basically subtract it from your background image, and then you do some, some processing on the, the foreground in order to sort of, sort of clean it up. And that's a chain of, of operators that you can uh, uh, well, that the system, that this uh, OpenVX system can, can leverage and actually get you more efficient operation. And, and in this graph here, what you see is the speed up from uh, using the graph. Uh, and so what, what happens here is, uh, well, and, and the, the graph along the bottom is how much it costs to go out to the main memory. And you can see here uh, the, the graph going up, but you get some savings even, even uh, if there's not a, a big um, uh, penalty for going out to the main memory. Uh, and, and the difference here is all of this tiling uh, that, that's happening, uh, it still happens even in the non-graph version, but it only happens within the nodes. And so the difference here is that uh, the, the uh, mapper, the graph mapper knows that uh, there's this sequence. So it can actually chain these things together uh, in the internal memory and, and not send, uh, you know, the result out to the main memory until it gets to the end. And so, although there's still tiling and stuff going on, it's this, this connection uh, purely from the graph that you get that gets you this uh, um, uh, performance increase. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's the brief introduction uh, to that. And if you have any further questions, well, will there be a Q&A answer uh, at the end? And also there's this uh, URL, you'll get all these slides, but there's this URL, ip.cadence.com slash vision to get more information. All right, so I'm going to throw it over to Kariti from AMD, who's gonna give you some more information about OpenVX in general and, uh, and about what we have there. All right, thanks, Frank. And thank you, everyone, uh, for attending today's webinar. Uh, I'm Kiridi, and I'm currently the OpenVX chair. So today's talk, we'll talk about computer vision and machine learning inference with OpenVX. So the agenda for today's talk, for we'll just go over OpenVX overview. I will kind of reiterate what the other speakers have already talked about. And then we'll look into what's new with OpenVX 1.3, the highlights and new features. And Neil has done a great job at answering all the common questions about um, OpenVX, but we'll just reiterate what he said and see if there's any, any new misconceptions we have. We'll talk about uh, what a conformant OpenVX implementation is. We'll look into an OpenVX sample implementation. We'll see what OpenVX for Raspberry Pi looks like. And then we'll take some time to do a, a case study with an OpenVX application, and uh, we'll and we'll see. We'll give some conclusions to this talk. All right. So OpenVX is open, royalty-free, cross-platform acceleration. So the first question is, uh, what is the API, right? So without going into the Wikipedia definitions, API is simply put: the application programming interface is like a messenger. Uh, basically, it takes your request, goes into a library, database, or an application, and brings back a response. And uh, in real world, you can look at as a simple analogy like a waiter. So you go into a restaurant, you have a menu of items, you choose what you want in the menu, you say, okay, this is what I want, and the waiter takes your order, goes into the kitchen, gets your meal. So... The API here uh, is the better the waiter understands what you want, the better you, your dish is gonna be. So an uh, API needs to understand what a developer needs. And when you request for something and it needs to get you your response. So with that, 
So why APIs are important, right? Like today APIs um, act as a building block. So if you are a developer developing an application, you don't wanna spend all your time developing everything from bottoms up. So you wanna use what's out there existing and use it as a Lego block to build your application. So like I said, using these as Lego blocks actually helps speed up your development and uh, uh, APIs, which are portable, gives you the speed where you don't have to develop for each OS or each platform. So they come portable. And uh, with all these in the background, uh, you don't have to worry about, you can concentrate more on your key application and spend more time on innovating there than spending time uh, worrying about the underneath library. So with that, OpenVX is portable uh, performance and a power optimized computer vision. And it's especially uh, important in today's embedded and real time use cases. And OpenVX, like Neil said, it's the only API shipped as an optimized driver. So you can see in this block diagram in this uh, slide is OpenVX kind of is in between the application layer and the hardware layer. So it, it connects uh, your application to the dedicated hardware or or any hardware in general and makes it optimized. And underneath, like the others have already mentioned, it can use CC++ or OpenCL. Uh, and here's an overview of uh, what an OpenVX graph framework looks like, right? So Neil has already said that the optimizations in the framework comes for you to developer as free of cost. So that means you don't have to go in and optimize anything. So once you use these APIs in your application, the framework takes care of giving you these optimizations and you don't have to code or worry about trying to get the best out of the hardware underneath. So the fusing of nodes, the uh, memory optimizations, they're all handled by the framework. And that gives you more uh, time to worry about your application on top layer. And like um, with more, and more uh, OpenVX available, uh, your application can be deployed on a wider range of hardware. So what are the highlights? So we just released OpenVX 1.3. I say just because it was last year and this year has gone really fast. So in October 2020, uh, 2019, we just released the 1.3. Uh, so they, we saw that uh, as we were growing as an API and adding more and more functionality, uh, for an adopter to actually implement all these functionality and try to be conformant was harder because there were components which maybe some adopters were not uh, keen on developing. So with uh, grouping these function uh, as feature sets really gave us the opportunity to make, uh, uh, you can say that the feature set could be implemented and the adopter can now, uh, okay. So the adopter doesn't have to implement all of the feature sets. So he can implement one or more, and then he can just uh, submit the conformance for that particular feature set. And we'll look at what each of these feature set is in the next slide. And uh, the feature set defined in OpenVX 1.3 are graph infrastructure, which is the baseline for all the feature sets and it's, uh, it's a must have. And then you have the vision, which is the core vision functionalities within it. And then you have the enhanced vision, which is the functions introduced in OpenVX 1.2. And we have the neural net inferencing, uh, which includes tensors and uh, neural net operators. And then we have the NNEF import, which uh, basically imports a pre-trained model in an NNEF format. And then we also have uh, binary images and safety critical uh, feature sets. So with that, we'll, we'll look into some of the common questions about OpenVX, right? So one of the common question we always get is, uh, is OpenVX an open source library? And uh, like we mentioned, open so OpenVX is an API and it's, uh, and developers and adopters actually build this library. So you can still do the pseudo app get OpenVX, it's available, but the OpenVX working group just defines the API. 
And uh, the, the other usual question is, must I pay royalties and licensing fees? Like already Neil mentioned, uh, uh, which is not the case. You don't have to. And the other one, uh, most common question is, uh, should I be a Kronos member to actually use the API or be an adopter? So that again is not true. You could be members or non-members and you could implement the conformant implementation of OpenVX and anybody can use the OpenVX implementations. The other one is um, always the common question when you compare OpenVX to OpenCV, you say, okay, is OpenVX functions limiting? Are they uh, smaller in number? Uh, like I mentioned, OpenVX Working Group was not trying to uh, just add every function out there and create this big API. So our core concentration was trying to uh, get the essence of the most used or most important functions and get a tighter focus on vision. And that's what the feature sets do now. So they have tighter focused on vision, enhanced vision, neural net, and uh, and the vendors are free to extend the API with their own custom nodes and their own custom extensions. And uh, that comes with the cost of portability. Uh, so if you're using two OpenVX implementations developed by two vendors, so usually these custom nodes and uh, vendor extensions are not guaranteed to port across. So that's something to keep in mind. And then the other common question is, okay, are implementations different in functionality? So that again, like Neil, Neil mentioned, uh, all the adopters, once they have to use the OpenVX logo, have to run this uh, conformance suit, which pretty much tests that the, the implementation does what it says it does. So if you're using it uh, on a platform A or a platform B developed by two different uh, companies, the, uh, the API always gives you the same result. And uh, usually these popular vendor extensions uh, usually get adopted as Kronos extensions with conformance test and people get, and that's the progression how our API is set to grow. So talking about conformant implementations, right? So like I said, we have an exhaustive test suite with thousands of test cases. So if when a vendor uh, creates an OpenVX implementation, they download this uh, conformant conformance test and runs it on its implementation and submits the results. The working group goes over the results and says that this implementation is conformant. And currently you can see all these vendors uh, have submitted an OpenVX uh, conformance test. And you can see pretty much all the major uh, silicon vendors are up there. And which means that you as a developer uh, can use these uh, implementations from that particular vendor when you use their silicon. And we also uh, put together the sample implementation. So the working group um, put this together and we have released this on GitHub. And basically this uh, sample implementation, like Neil said, it gives you uh, a implementation which you can test and try to prototype your application and the key thing here is this is not a reference implementation, uh, like reference usually supersedes an API. Uh, this is not really optimized for every platform out there and it's not production ready. So if you want to use an optimized OpenVX library, you're still gonna go and grab it from the vendors and you're gonna use it on their hardware. And if you are just trying to see or just trying to figure out, uh, this is a great, a great implementation to start out with. And then we just released uh, the OpenVX for Raspberry Pi in July, 2020. So the Kronos group and the Raspberry Pi Foundation came together and we created this open source implementation of OpenVX 1.3. And like I said, this implementation again is completely open sourced and it's available on GitHub. And I'll provide all the links and um, all the resources at the end. And this implementation, uh, like I said, because it's 1.3, it needs to specify which feature set it has compliance in. So, so this particular implementation passes the vision, enhanced vision, neural net, and NNEF kernel import. And uh, the NNEF kernel import is something we just released. So 
uh, you guys can look up on GitHub. And this implementation is Neon Optimize. And because it's open source, you can look at the code or make some changes to yourself or uh, you can you can freely contribute and we'll accept it into our open source. And it's conformant on Raspberry Pi 3 and Raspberry Pi 4. And this was some of the code. Uh, this is Ebden, the chief executive of Raspberry Pi. He was really excited to get um, OpenVX on the platform and OpenVX was highlighted on their website. And uh, okay, so this is what we were talking about, the NNEF import conformance feature set. And this is available right now on GitHub. So basically what this does, it defines a minimum set of neural net uh, functionality where a neural net can be imported into an OpenVX and run as a graph. So basically it's just one function where you define that that's the part where you're gonna import uh, an NEF file. It gets into the OpenVX graph and it runs the neural net part. And then you can add vision functions before and after to do your pre-processing and post-processing. So the whole graph remains in OpenVX, so you still get all the advantages of being in a single graph. And the, like I said, the, the, the memory optimizations, the, the node fusions, they're all available uh, within the framework. All right, so with all that information, let's see uh, a case study of a simple application. So what we did is uh, the working group went ahead and created a GitHub for a bunch of uh, sample applications, which is available right now. So you can go ahead and try them with our sample implementation or any conformant implementation in that case. So, so what I did is I went ahead and took one of these applications, which is called a skin tone detector sample. Uh, basically this just looks for your hand and face and you could add more functionality to it, but for our study today, we'll just concentrate on the skin tone detector sample. So what it is, is a pretty simple application and it takes uh, an image, it does a bunch of uh, substracts and does thresholds and does a bunch of ants. And then you kind of see a person's hand and face. So what I did is I took that application and I built it with the Raspberry Pi implementation of OpenVX, which was open sourced again. And, and without having to change anything on my source code of the application, I was able to build it on the Raspberry Pi 4 and run it. And the same thing what I did is I took the same, same application without changing any source code. And this time I compiled the AMD's open source uh, MI Vision X for the OpenVX libraries. And again, without having to change any code on my sample implementation, was able to run this on an x86 processor, whereas previously I was running on an ARM processor. And I went ahead and did the same thing. I, on um, Ubuntu, I built the sample implementation by the Kronos group for the OpenVX libraries without having to change anything on my source code, ran the application fine. And I did the same thing on my Mac. I just built the same application, used AMD's open source MI Vision X for OpenVX libraries. So what this tells you is without, as a developer, so you can develop your application and not have to worry about uh, trying to port them across OSs and platforms if you use the API, which is already does that for you. Right, so, so what are, let's look at what are some of the performance and uh, memory footprint issues that I uh, looked at. So over here, uh, what I have left, what I call an OpenVX unoptimized is I built this OpenVX graph without using the graph structure, which there is an option for it, which is called the VXU node, which is pretty much an immediate node. So you run, write your whole application as, uh, a single function, serial functionality. And then I wrote uh, the same function with OpenVX graph. And then you can see uh, without me having to do anything, the framework already gave me 2.5X of performance. And the same thing with memory footprint. So using an unoptimized OpenVX, or uh, you could say that you could also do the same thing with OpenCV if you wanna uh, try and test it out. 
And then if you use the framework, like, like the others have already said, the framework looks through your application and tries to reuse memory and re-optimize it to get a lower memory footprint. So in this case, an unoptimized graph, I was getting around um, 1x for like, uh, and a 2.3 point, uh, it's almost a reduction of 0.8. So especially in use cases where you want to run these application on tight memory budget, so these kind of optimizations come really, in, uh, uh, actually comes very handy. All right, some conclusions. Uh, like as a developer, you know, uh, whenever you are trying to build an application, you want to keep in mind that uh, what kind of APIs are going into your application. So that's something I always think about. Okay, is my application uh, going to be portable? Uh, can I use multiple platform? So those are some things that I would advise for developers if you're looking into why choose OpenVX. So these kind of things come to you by just using the API. And on terms of acceleration, you already saw on like a simple application that I showed that there is great benefit in using um, the OpenVX API within your application. And like, like always, uh, it is portable, it is efficient, and um, I would advise if you have time, go ahead, download the GitHub projects and try it out. And a few acknowledgement, uh, I would like to thank Mike, AMD's MI Vision X team, the OpenVX working group, Neil and the Kronos team for putting this talk together. And this is all the resources that I uh, used or for you as developer to go ahead and look at And a few disclaimer. All right, so we can go into the question. Thank you, Greedy. Thank you. Right. First, uh, I would like to ask the attendees, um, if you currently are using OpenVX, if you have some use cases you would like to share, feel free to do so in the chat feature. Um, first, I have a, a question from the audience. Um, do you have plans to optimize OpenVX on OpenCL for Raspberry Pi? I, I can take that question. So we we did uh, release the open source implementation with the uh, OpenCL part of it. And we, because there is no open source OpenCL on Raspberry Pi at the moment, so that, that project is stalled. But I we are looking into that and uh, hopefully you will find out on our website. If, if that project's gonna go somewhere. Okay, um, another question we have is, any plans to make OpenVX part of the operating systems, for instance, Windows or Mac? Sure, so that's really a question for Apple and Microsoft, um, but I, I'm not aware of any plans for them to build it in as a kernel level driver, but if you would, um, take OpenVX onto platforms like Mac and Windows, you would typically you know, layer um, the OpenVX implementation over uh, lower level drivers that are available on those platforms. So uh, on you know, Windows, you, know, uh, you can use OpenCL. That would be the most obvious choice. Um, but there's no reason not to you know, have implementations of OpenVX over, the, over other low level uh, APIs. Wonderful. And Mike, do you want to talk? I mean, yeah, I can add to that for just a second. So the AMD implementation is 100% open source and it runs on x86 CPU. And so you can run it on the Mac uh, as it is today. That was one of the examples security showed. And on Windows, it uh, runs on x86 on the CPU and it's uh, open sale optimized for the GPU. Uh, <clears throat> so it can run on Windows there. Thanks, Mike. And it also runs on Linux, like, like I showed. Right. Yeah. Is there an optimized open source implementation of OpenVX? Yeah, so that's just uh, what I was saying is the oh. AMD version is optimized on x86 and it runs like on Mac, Windows, and Linux. 
Thank the you. other optimized implementation is the open source Raspberry Pi implementation, which has the neon optimizations. So if you're trying to run on a Raspberry Pi, so you can go ahead and use this open source implementation. Why choose NNEF as the format for OpenVX neural net import feature set? Yeah, I can I can take that one. That's a good, good question. So, you know, there are quite a few neural network exchange formats uh, out there in the industry, um, but NNEF is unique. It's the only one that is a formal specification that is um, under the multi-company governance of um, kernels. So, it's not going to change without any warning. A lot of the uh, open source frameworks, you know, they do such excellent work, and this is not a criticism, but by definition, you know, they're all researching and um, creating new um, versions of their frameworks, and the formats often change, which is great if you're doing uh, training and wanting to keep up on you know, the, the latest techniques. But if we're going to define a specification to um, import, um, a whole trained network. You know, we need to have a stable format that the drivers know how to uh, interpret. And that's really, I think, the value of NNEF. Um, whereas uh, Onyx and TensorFlow and a bunch of the other open source frameworks are doing great work. Um, it's really for the training and research community. For the hardware, embedded hardware community, you know, we need something more stable. And that is Know, the value that NNF, NNEF provides. It has a very well defined uh, uh, roadmap and you know, it's stable enough that we can uh, use it as a specification you know, alongside uh, OpenVX. Thank you. <clears throat> Will the AMD version run on uh, NVIDIA OpenCL2? So there's no reason why it couldn't, but uh, as delivered, uh, we don't enable that. And so someone would have to take the open source version and just make it uh, recognize the NVIDIA hardware that you're trying to use. Thank you. Do open source implementations of OpenVX have to pay adopter fees? Let, let me take that one too. So um, the, the adopter fee, as we briefly mentioned the adopter fee is, is this it's a small fee um, it's a, it's a, um, you know, to 10k or of the order of 10k so uh, we need that just to uh, cover the cost of um, maintaining the adopters program it's a small fraction of uh, any company's costs who are doing a commercial implementation of uh, openvx but of course we want to encourage open source implementations too and so uh, Kronos has a long uh, proud tradition of uh, when open source projects want to implement uh, a Kronos API, um, we would typically waive the adopters fees for bona fide open source uh, projects. Um, so uh, we typically wouldn't uh, charge uh, open source implementations the adopters fees. So it's, it's free for them to implement and to be conformant to. What's in the OpenVX safety critical feature set that makes it easier to certify? Um, yeah, hi, this is Frank. I, I can take that. So um, there's there's two main things. One is, um, well, we use this feature set uh, to sort of divide the the facilities of OpenVX into a a what do we call it the developer development feature set and the deployment feature set and so all of the stuff for creating graphs and compiling and optimizing them are in the development feature set and then in the deployment feature set uh is just the the ability to run the graphs and and get the results so uh so because let, let's say you're doing an automotive application and, and you you you, you, you don't want to run a graph compiler on the car, probably. You, you just want to have a pre-compiled graph, uh, pre-allocated all the memory. Uh, this is all, you know, this typical safety critical stuff. You, do, you don't want a lot of dynam dynamicism uh, in, in that. So, so by having that, uh, um, that subdivision of the, 
uh, feature sets uh, enables that. Um, and then you only have to sort of do all of the safety critical verification on the deployment set and the things you did there instead of the whole whole shebang. Uh, the second thing is that um, the spec itself has, well, well, many requirements, uh, but in, in the spec, it's now uh, got an actual label on every requirement. And if you've done a safety critical development, you know that you have to uh, track all of your requirements from their inception in the spec uh, through implementation and testing. And so this uh, set of uh, labels enables you to, to do that process uh, in your safety critical implementation of, of OpenVX. Thank you. Um, I think this has to do with the resource slide. Um, where would one find the way to develop OpenVX on the Mac slash window AMD NVIDIA GPUs? So the resources. So on the main uh, OpenVX website, we have like a resources tab where all the resources and educational material, like previously recorded webinars are all available. And uh, there's also a great uh, reference guide, uh, which you can look at for all the API reference. And there's also a great OpenVX programming guide. And uh, uh, Frank and a few others from the OpenVX working group actually wrote this book and it's available. So they have great examples of how to use the OpenVX and how they have a bunch of sample applications. So that's a great resource to actually look into. Yeah, and I'll kind of answering that question in a slightly different way. I think the uh, it kind of comes to the answer that Mike had before. The, the, the most common underlying accelerated, uh, accelerator API, if you want to have an accelerated, OpenVX across the different desktop systems. Now it would be OpenCL. It's available on, on you know, all of the major GPU vendors. Apparently still available on Mac, but it has been deprecated. Um, but it, you know it would work today um, to run over OpenCL. It's going to be interesting to see longer term. You know, um, do people start implementing OpenVX over some of the GPU compute? APIs is the GPU compute APIs like Vulkan um, for the cross standard platform. Um, and you know, it would need to be metal on uh, Mac, whether people layer OpenVX over those uh, APIs as we move forward, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But uh, OpenCL is you know, the, the way for portable acceleration right now, and particularly in the embedded mobile space, it's you know, getting a lot of momentum there. Wonderful. And thank you everyone for joining us today. As we're